It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Speaker, and this question is for the Premier. The fall economic statement showed a pretty bleak outlook for housing in our province. Housing starts are down, and this government is nowhere near being able to meet their own targets. They wasted years chasing schemes, all while more people saw the dream of owning a home slide away or went from eviction to encampment. Our plan, the NDP's Homes Ontario plan, would realize the human right to housing, at least doubling the supply of permanently affordable housing. Will the government support this important step in getting government back in the business of building housing again? Thank you. Members of PSA proceeds to reply. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to rise. And let me just uh, categorically uh, say that absolutely not. We will not be supporting the motion that was brought forward by the Leader of the Opposition today. Let me just say this, Mr. Speaker. It is motions like that, it is policies like that, that, it, that motivated me to get into office in the first place. Let me tell you, the moment that the government thinks, that a socialist party thinks, that they can do a better job of building homes than the private sector, that is when we are in trouble. Because we have seen this before, Mr. Speaker. The Premier talked about how the Bob Ray government got him into politics, Mr. Speaker. For millions and millions and millions of, of Ontarians, it was that government that stopped, that began the process of, uh, of people reevaluating the dream of home ownership. Since we have come into office, Mr. Speaker, we have done everything Spons? possible to remove the obstacles that were put in the way by the Liberals and the NDPs. And before, before the interest rate hikes, Mr. Speaker, we were building homes at a record pace in the province of Ontario, and we will do that again, Mr. The supplementary question. I think, uh, I think the minister needs to go back to the history books and learn a little bit about the history of governments for many generations building homes and housing for people in this province. This government promised to build one and a half million homes by 2031. But every year since they made that promise, they have failed to meet their own targets. The government will miss their housing target again this year, 40,000 not being built. That's on top of the 20,000 homes that they didn't build last year. That's based on their own reporting that shows the trend for the next few years just going down and down. Every year, this government is falling farther and farther behind, and Ontarians pay the price for that. So does the Premier, again, have a plan to meet his own targets, or is he abandoning them altogether? Members of please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, the Leader of the Opposition doesn't know what she is talking about. Governments do not build homes, Mr. Speaker. Governments have never built homes. The private sector have built homes. Generations of Canadians and Ontarians have come to this province and have helped us build communities for the people of the province of Ontario. Now, here's where we disagree, and here's where we disagree constantly with them, Mr. Speaker, because for the opposition, the Liberal and the NDP opposition, they're happiest. They're happiest when people People rely solely on government, Mr. Speaker. When the people have to go to them to rely on homes, Mr. Speaker, when they rely on government, that's when the Liberals and NDP are happiest. When I am most happy, when we are most happy, is when we put the resources in place that allow people to realize their dream, Mr. Speaker. That is why we are removing obstacles. That is why when we were removing the obstacles, we had the highest starts in history, and it wasn't until the high inflation policies of the federal Liberal government that we saw that stop start to change, Mr. Speaker. We'll double down, remove obstacles, and get the job done. Very much. Final supplementary. Where are they? Where are the homes? What you're doing is not working. The people of Ontario know it. Waiting for interest rates to fall is not a plan. Hoping the market is going to magically adjust itself isn't going to get housing built. The Premier needs to do his job. Update zoning rules today. Allow the fourplexes in all neighbourhoods. Increase density near transit like you planned and then you scrapped that bill. 
These measures alone would unlock the potential to build millions of new affordable homes all across this province. Will the Premier scrap the schemes and focus on reversing his government's absolutely disastrous record on housing? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And, and, and there you really, there you have it, Mr. Speaker, in that, in that response. There you have it, right? Interest rates don't matter. Tell that to the thousands, the millions of people who, because of the high inflation, high spending policies of the federal liberal and conservative socialist government, they were priced out of their ability to buy their home, Mr. Speaker. Think of the thousands of homes and shovels that are not in the ground because of the high inflation policies of a federal NDP government, which made interest rates so high in such a short period of time, they could no longer afford to get shovels in the ground, Mr. Speaker. Contrast that to what we were doing. We were removing obstacles, and we removed obstacles. We made it cheaper to get shovels in the ground. We made it more affordable for that to happen, Mr. Speaker. You know what happened? More homes were being built in the province of Ontario than at any right. time Fonds. in our history. Single detached homes, purpose-built rentals, Mr. Speaker. We're going to double down, remove the obstacles, and set aside a federal government that doesn't care about housing, an opposition that doesn't care about housing, and we'll deliver $1.5 million. Thank you very much. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, I want to go back to the Premier again. We know one of the reasons why this Premier has so utterly failed to get housing built is because they were too busy carving up the green belt uh, for their speculator friends. One of the key staffers involved in that scandal and scheme, Ryan Amato, is back in the news today for his continued refusal to disclose emails and records from his personal accounts related to his communication with lobbyists. Everything points to the use of personal emails to get around FOI requests. Amato even infamously asked in a handwritten note, is this FOIable? Can the Premier shed some light on what exactly is in these emails and why his staff were using personal emails to talk to lobbyists? The parliamentary assistant, the member for Brantford Brant. Oh, thank you, Speaker, and thank them. I thank the member for the question. Speaker, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing is committed to its obligations under the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and the Archives and Record Keeping Act. We have zero tolerance for any wrongdoing and expect anyone involved in the decision making about the Greenbelt lands Position to have side order. the letter of the law. Speaker, we will Order. continue to pursue every avenue available to request that any relevant records be turned over in accordance with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and the Archives and Record Keeping Act. We'll say it again. We'll do this. Thank you. The opposition, supplementary question. Just look, Speaker, how far back in the benches they have to go to find somebody to read that statement. <laughs> side will come to order. Order. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Order. The government side will come to order. Having sat in the back row myself for many years, I always thought every seat in here is a good seat.
order. Ah, order. I think we can start again. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Wow, that really hit a nerve. I, I see that, Speaker. Um, but look, this is why this is why this matters, Speaker. Order. This staffer was Order. using this. Wow. We're from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. My goodness, I I know they don't like talking about this, but my goodness, this staffer was using his personal emails to communicate with lobbyists about Greenbelt lands in order to avoid FOI requests. It is part of a pattern of disregarding the rules to carve up the green belt, to increase speculator profits, to give away ministerial zoning orders in brown envelopes to insiders. Question. So to the Premier again, is this standard operating procedure in your government to avoid the law and shield bad actors from accountability? Member for Brantford Brant and Parliamentary System. Thank you, Speaker. And I the question, and uh, I, I don't feel sorry for the Leader of the Opposition if she's offended by my presence here in the House. But I am pleased to take my seat here and to be the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs serving in the office of the Premier. But, Speaker, as we have said, and we will continue to say, our government has answered this question a number of times for the Leader of the Opposition, and we will continue to do so. If the Leader of the Opposition has any additional information or any information whatsoever that she would like to provide to the Commissioner, I encourage her to do so. But, Speaker, as for our government, we will fully cooperate. If there is a staffer in this government that has or had done something wrong, we will root it out and we will get that taken care of. Speaker, we are here for the people of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. This is the next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, I appreciate the challenge that the government Final is... Supplement. Okay. Final supplement. Speaker, I appreciate the challenge that the Premier and his government are faced with. It is hard to hold your staff to account to get them to follow the rules when the Premier himself won't comply with them. For over a year, he has fought to keep his own records from public view, including phone calls and other communications that point to his own role in the Greenbelt scheme. What will it take for the Premier to, stop, to start to follow information and privacy laws? and disclose his own records and those of his staff? Is it going to be the RCMP uh, criminal investigation? What is it going to take for this government to start actually being honest and accountable to the people of Ontario? Members, please take their seat. Again, to reply, the member for Brantford Grant in Parliament. Thank you again, Speaker, and thank you for the question. I will say again, that the Premier's Office and the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing is committed to its obligations under the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and the Archives and Record Keeping Act. We have zero tolerance for any wrongdoing and expect anyone involved in the decision-making process about the Greenbelt lands to have followed the letter of the law. We will continue to pursue every avenue available to request that any relevant records be turned over in accordance with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act and the Archives and Record Keeping Act. Speaker, we've answered this question many times. We will answer it again if the Leader of the Opposition wishes to say that, but while they're busy trying to distract the people of Ontario about what's going on, we are building the province of Ontario. We are building the opposition We are building the schools. We are building the highways that the people of Ontario need in order to get on with their daily lives. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. We learned last week that while the government was appointing an associate minister responsible for auto thefts, there was a car theft ring operating within Service Ontario right under the Premier's nose. These public employees weren't smashing in windows or picking locks. They were registering fraudulent VINs to stolen vehicles for resale. 
These fraudulent VINs are running rampant, and the government has failed to implement any preventative measures. All of their ideas are after the crime. The police want a VIN verification system. Other provinces have already implemented a VIN verification system. What is stopping this government from taking real action to protect the VIN registry? The Minister of Public Bus and Business Service Delivery and Procurement. Procure Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member for Oshawa. As all members of this House know, auto fraud is a serious criminal matter. And at Service Ontario, we take cooperation with law enforcement very seriously. That's why we have procedures in place, training in place, upgrades in place to make sure that auto fraud is detected and that those responsible are apprehended and prosecuted. In fact, it was through Service Ontario procedures that there was internal detection and that those responsible were identified, apprehended, and are being prosecuted. That's working with law enforcement to make sure that this, this unacceptable criminal activity is eradicated. And I'm very proud of our Service Ontario dedicated employees across, across Ontario who are here serving the people of Ontario, standing up against crime. Speaker. Police and experts are looking for preventative measures. But let's be perfectly clear, none of the measures that the government has proposed to stop car thefts would have actually prevented the crimes. A helicopter won't be able to see a fraudulent VIN number. At once you've arrested the car thieves and their accomplices, cars are already long gone. But there's one obvious solution that the government seems unwilling to try to stop car thieves in their tracks a VIN verification program that has already been implemented in other provinces. So what's stopping the government from taking action now to maintain the integrity of Ontario's VIN registry? To reply, the Minister, Associate Minister of Auto Theft and Bail Reform. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the member talked about Project Thoroughbred, which was led by the Toronto Police. What they failed to mention was that was an investigation funded by this government through the CISO that they voted against. We've put more police on our streets, almost 2,100, used to be 1,400 under their government supporting the Liberals. We've got helicopters on the way, something that police have told us they need to hold offenders accountable to catch dangerous criminals, avoid car chases. You know, the members opposite talk a big game. They vote against all these measures. When we have police leadership in those benches, every single member stands up. The difference is... When the police leave, PC Party continues to stand up for our hardworking police. We'll never apologize for that. We'll keep calling for bail reform and common sense reform to keep criminals behind bars. We invite the NDP to join us. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. The hard-working men and women across this great province are feeling the pressure of rising costs in their personal finances. We all know that the trudeau Crombie carbon tax is driving up prices for day-to-day -day necessities. Families are being forced to pay more for everything from grocery bills to home heating and fuel for their cars. Speaker, people in my riding of Simcoe Gray and across the province need financial relief. Ontarians want to see real cost-cutting measures that will make their lives easier. Speaker, through you, can the minister tell the House what our government is doing to help Ontarians who need support right now? Minister of Finance. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and my thanks to the member for Simcoe Cray, uh, Gray for that great question. Thank you, uh, member. Um, you know, the Liberals, uh, let's remind everyone that the Liberals supported the carbon tax. They supported it here in this House. They support it up the 401, uh, and they continue to champion higher costs. In fact, the member opposite's uh, uh, leader there supports increased taxes, increased fees, and thinks that, uh, you know, taking money putting money into people's pockets is a bad thing. Now, I would ask this House, putting money back into the hard-working people of Ontario's pockets, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. Thank you. Putting your hand in someone's pocket and taking money out, is that a good thing or a bad thing? 
So the difference, Mr. Speaker, between our party and theirs, good thing Fox. on this side, bad thing on that side. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. I know the residents in Simcoe Gray are happy to see initiatives that will keep more money in their pockets. This tax rebate is welcome news for families in Ontario that have been burdened with the high costs of the federal carbon tax and interest rates. Speaker, the Liberals do not agree with our approach. They would rather saddle Ontarians with more fees and add new taxes. Our government is leading by example and, Speaker, by respecting the taxpayers. But we know more needs to be done to keep costs low and make life more affordable for Ontarians. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what other steps our government has taken to provide relief for Ontarian families and businesses? And the Minister of Finance. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and once again, thanks to the great member of Sinclair Gray for that uh, question. You know, the leader of the uh, Liberal Party over there, uh, she thinks this is a gimmick, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, do, does, do people think that putting $200 back into the vast majority of families who need this money back into their pockets is a gimmick? No. You know, does this... This is the party that supported the carbon tax. This is a party that uh, increased fees, they increased uh, taxes. And let's just go back in time a little bit. Who put on the tools in Durham on the 412, 418? It was that party, Mr. Speaker. Who raised the wine tax and the beer tax? It was that party, Mr. Speaker. Who increased driver license fees? It was that party. But let me remind the House which party has Response? taken the tolls off the 412, 418. Which party? This party. We did. Who cut the wine tax? No. This party? We did. This party. Who took uh, the fees, the driver's license stickers, off the hardworking people's pocket in, and put money in their pockets? It was this, this party, party, Mr. Speaker. We'll never tire working for the people of Ontario. And once again, I'll remind the members to make the comments through the chair. Next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Last week, the member for Oshawa and I asked about the 600 government engineers who have been without a collective agreement for over 22 months. The Professional Engineers Government of Ontario workers design, plan and oversee $85 billion in public infrastructure projects. They also provide vital services for water, air quality, mine safety and much more. My question, Speaker, has the Conservative government locked out their unionized employees? The President of the Treasury Board to reply. The government's goal is to negotiate fair and reasonable collective agreements for Ontario's dedicated public servants. We want to make sure that they're in line with legislative requirements and that they support our long-term fiscal sustainability. Mr. Speaker, we have been at the negotiating table for months with PAYGO, and our latest offer recognizes the important role that PAYGO employees play. That said, it would be inappropriate to comment any further as the, ma as the matter is before the Ontario Labour Relations Board, Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. We have provided a fair offer to the Opego employees, and we look forward to seeing them at the table again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My next question is for the Premier again. Uh, for the workers, for workers that have been low to the contract for more than a year, the PEGO workers have been more than reasonable. They're paid substantially less than their private sector counterparts. They haven't had a labour dispute in 35 years. They've tried to bargain for almost two years. Meanwhile, the government has only showed up to bargain for 30 days over that time. Boy. And the last time was three months ago. When these workers withdrew their engineering services on the Bradford Bypass on Highway 413, the Conservative government apparently had informed the workers they can only return to work when the government tells them. Mm. Is this well, what public sector professionals can expect from the Conservative government, bargaining in bad faith and being unlawfully locked out? Okay. <laughs> Members, please take their seats. Once again. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Speaker. Well, let me be, be very clear. Since July of last year, the government has held numerous bargaining sessions with PAYGO and their bargaining team in an effort to reach a fair deal at the table. In fact, our last time at the bargaining table was on October 18th of this year, Speaker. With respect to the latest walkout, employees represented by PAYGO have decided to fully withdraw their services and they have been reminded of the relevant terms and conditions of their employment. Like any employee who refuses to work, PAYGO employees who refuse to work will not be paid. But Mr. Speaker, this information was clearly communicated to PAYGO leadership and PAYGO representative Order. employees. 
The government res respects PAYGO's rights and remains committed to reaching a fair and reasonable deal at the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Mines. Ontario has a rich mining history, especially gold mining, which has a long provided jobs and economic strength for our communities. Gold is more than a mineral in Ontario. It represents opportunity, innovation, and prosperity, especially in our northern regions. With gold prices remaining high, the demand for Ontario natural resources continues to grow. We know that the opening more gold mines here in Ontario would mean more jobs more investments and more support for local businesses. Mm -hmm. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the gold, the government, industry and uh, First Nations can come together to support the growth of gold mining across Ontario? And to reply, the Minister of Mines. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for that question. How appropriate to be talking about gold today when the price of gold is over $3,800 an ounce Canadian. Wow. And for a guy that uh, represents Timmins, a gold mining community, this is music to my ears. You're here. I was, it was a real pleasure for me to open uh, go two gold mines this summer. One was Cody Lake uh, Mines, just south of Gogama, and the other was the Greenstone Mine. And the Greenstone Mine, like all mines, is a very special place. It's designed with sustainability in, 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 uh, in, uh, in mind. Designed so that the footprint is as small as, as it possibly can. It's designed to improve the water quality in the environment. As you know, it's in the Long Lac and Geraldton area, old gold mining sounds. So it's reprocessing Response. tailings, it's cleaning the environment. And it's in support of the five nations that are in that area that this, prop, this, that this uh, project got built. The five First Nations committees in the area. Jobs are created and it's, it happens because we're working together. Industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, gold mining is one of Ontario's biggest opportunities to drive economic growth and support local communities. The mining industry doesn't just create jobs, it builds careers and livelihoods, especially for people in northern Ontario and nearby Indigenous communities. Gold mining projects bring life to our northern towns and provide lasting infrastructure and investment. The Greenstone Gold Mine is a prime example of how we can make this happen, creating hundreds of jobs and generating real local benefits. As other provinces ramp up their mining industry, Ontario must stay competitive. We need to keep supporting these projects to ensure long-term prosperity in our communities. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Mines please share what more Ontario can do to strengthen gold mining and secure a brighter future for Northern Ontario? The Associate Minister of Mines. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the great member uh, from my neighbouring riding of Mississauga Lakeshore for the question. Great. Speaker, gold mining has a critical role for the province by fueling Northern Ontario's economy and generating prosperity for Indigenous communities. That's why the opening of the Greenstone Gold Mine was truly remarkable. Yeah, this $1.6 billion project not only strengthens Ontario's mining portfolio, but also brings long-term benefits to Indigenous communities through partnerships and career paths. Absolutely. Today, the mine supports five 500 local jobs and has created over 800 jobs in the region. Amazing. I was lucky enough to join a tour of the state-of-the-art operation and see what is possible when Indigenous communities and mining companies have lasting partnerships. I was thoroughly impressed with the incredible facility and the dedication to safety and sustainability. Environmental sustainability was at the forefront Response. of the mine's development. This project demonstrates that Ontario continues to be a leader in mining, driving investments that benefit not only the sector, but also various communities that rely on it. It's all happening right here in Ontario. Here, here, here. Thank you very much. The next question. The member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. A memo prepared last fall for the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services told you that children with complex needs are being placed in hotels, Airbnbs, and even in CAS offices due to the lack of suitable placements in the community. Your government has had this report for over a year, and yet you continue to let the crisis grow. In that year, children have been displaced and some have died. What are you doing to make sure that one more child is not put in these dangerous conditions? 
Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I thank the honourable member for the important question. Mr. Speaker, as I said from day one, our government prioritizes the safety and well-being of children and youth in this province, which is why when it comes to support for children's aid societies across the province, we are investing $1.7 billion to make sure every child, every youth has the supports they need to succeed and thrive, Mr. Speaker. Now, that $1.7 billion, Mr. Speaker, includes $14 million increase this year in child protection services. Mr. Speaker, that is on top of the $76.3 million increase last year to support societies for the Ready, Set, Go program that we initiated to make sure every child, every youth is set up for success, Mr. Speaker. We went one step further to make sure no child and youth in this province is left behind. We increased our face funding by $36.5 million. So, Mr. Speaker, let me make it very clear to every child, every youth in this province, we will never, ever, ever waver from our commitment to protecting you, making sure you succeed in life. Thank you. The supplementary question. The only action that this government has done is to punish the service providers who they have underfunded. That's right. That is what this government has continued to do, and our kids are suffering each and every day for it. Speaker, it shouldn't be so complicated. An audit is not going to make one child safer tonight, and it will not put a permanent roof over the head of even one child. So the real question is, what is this government going to do to protect vulnerable children today and stop leaving these kids behind? Members of Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, Speaker. And again, I'll let the House know, Mr. Speaker, while we increased investments for children's aid societies across this province by nearly $129 million over 10 years, the number of children and youth across the province has decreased by 30% in that time right. period. And Mr. Speaker, when I say we take that seriously, we absolutely will look at making sure we children and youth are protected. Mr. Speaker, when a child is placed in an unlicensed provider where they experience abuse, and were exposed to illicit drugs, yes, we're going to review to make sure that they're protected. Mr. Speaker, when a youth is placed in an unlicensed home that failed fire safety requirements, yes, we're going to introduce to protect them, Mr. Speaker. When this, Mr. Speaker, society uses funding for mortgage and capital improvements, yes, we're going to step in. Mr. Speaker, as I've said it before, and I'll say it again, when it comes to the future of this province, the children and youth, we will never, ever, ever, ever waver from our commitment, with or without the support of the NDP, Mr. Speaker. Members of please take their seats. I don't know how that paycheck makes you eat your soul like that. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Order. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Will come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The government side will come to order. We still have a ways to go. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier, who has 32,000 people in his riding without a family doctor, yesterday the Premier posted about an interactive map showing all the new places you can buy booze one year early. All it took was a billion dollars. Everyone knows this was a last-ditch attempt to increase the Premier's popularity before calling an early election. But it made me think, Order. if you live in Ontario and don't happen to drink, it's as if this government has done nothing for you. It may be slightly easier to find booze, but when it comes to finding a family doctor, it's harder than ever. A million more people don't have a family doctor now than in 2018. There are over two and a half million people without a family doctor right now, and that number will skyrocket to 4.4 million by 2026. Twice this year, the Premier has come out with an interactive booze map, but it's still no easier to find a family doctor. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, question. a simple question. Why does this Premier think it's more important to advertise booze than health care? To reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, you know, when I look at what we've been able to accomplish under Premier Ford, where we now have two new medical schools that are going to start in the province of Ontario, Northern Ontario School of Medicine, the number of seats that are available are almost doubling. And then, and then Speaker, I have, to, I have to remind the member opposite of a 2025, 2015 article, Ontario cuts. 50 medical residency places. Oh. Order. 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 The OMA calls the side, come to order. 50 first year residency spaces, quote, irresponsible and unacceptable. You know, I will put our record up against the previous Liberal government any day of the week. Order. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I thought I'd get an answer like that, so I have a report of my own. This is a map of the top 10 Conservative ridings Order. with the most people that don't have a Order. family doctor. When the members opposite hear their riding, I ask that they please stand up and take a bow. The member from Brampton West, who has 27,500 people in his riding without a family doctor. The member from Scarborough Rouge Park, who has 28,000. The member from Kenora Rainy River, 29,000 people without a family doctor. Doctor. The member from Brampton East with 30,000. The member from Chad of Kent Leamington and Nepean, 31,000 apiece. The member from Tobacco North, order. also the Premier of Ontario, who has. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member will take his seat. The member will take his seat. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Don Valley East has the floor legitimately to pose his question. I need to be able to hear him. Just a second. Stop. Just a second. Just a second. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait till the House calms down before I recognize the member again. Start the clock. The member for Don Valley East has the floor. Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, the member from Etobicoke North, also the Premier of Ontario, with 32,000 people without a family doctor. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London, 38,000. Member from Bay of Quinney, 39,000. And at number one, we have the member from Etobicoke Centre, with 40,000 people in a riding without a family doctor. Mr. Speaker. Why won't the Premier let his own members fight for their own constituents' most basic health care needs? Minister of Health. You know, the fact that the member opposite is ignoring the inconvenient truth that they were the ones who cut residency seats in the province of Ontario. Our government, brand new expanded medical school in Scarborough, brand Expanded brand new school, medical school in the city of Brampton. A, a school in Vaughan that will be specifically focused on training family physicians. As I say, I look at the investments that we have made with our medical schools, with the College of Nurses, with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario to make sure that people who want to practice in the province of Ontario have that opportunity. We are removing those barriers. We are expanding the health care system and the residency positions in the province of Ontario Response. because we understand that as we have more people in the province of Ontario, as our population ages, we have to plan unlike the previous Liberal government. Yeah. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. People across Ontario want to see more homes built and they need affordable options, but high interest rates from the federal government are slowing things down. 
high interest rates are making it harder to finance projects. And then there's the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax. Yeah. It adds extra cost to every single stage of building new homes. The people who want to buy these homes end up paying more. Builders are telling us they can't afford to start new projects because the federal government makes things more expensive. Our government has taken action. We're cutting red tape, helping builders, and reducing costs where we can. But these extra barriers from Ottawa are holding Ontario back. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what more can be done to get homes built for Ontarians? Parliamentary assistant and member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. As my great colleague mentioned, the federal Liberal NDP Spooky Coalition in Ottawa's disastrous tax and spend policies are seriously impacting the pace of new home construction in Ontario. But well, that is why our, they already laughed, Speaker, because they don't want to hear the truth, That's Speaker. Right. But we are here to, stand, to, to deliver the truth and to stand with our home builders. And that's why, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we've been calling on the federal government to reduce interest rates and that's why we have redoubled our efforts to reduce red tape and streamline approvals so when interest rates fall like the opposition poll numbers we'll be ready to get more shovels in the ground we removed the full 8% of the provincial HST on purpose-built rental housing. We provided discounts and exemptions for on development charges for affordable Spots. units. We introduced common sense changes to make it easier to build garden, laneway and basement suites. Wonderful. We introduced a new provincial planning statement to make it busy, uh, easier to build more housing near major transit stations. And we invested $3 billion in infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. The next for the supplementary question. Speaker, thank, thank you to the parliamentary assistant for this answer. People across Ontario need more housing options. They need homes they can afford. But high interest rates from the federal government continue to make it tough to start new projects. And with the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax, the costs keep piling up. Home builders are telling us they want to help, but they face so many barriers and red tape from the federal government. Our government needs to continue making changes to make building easier. Our government has cut red tape and helped people get started, but more action is needed. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant please explain how our government supports families and builders who want to add new homes, like basement apartments and laneway houses? Member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and our government knows that to solve the housing crisis, we need to be constructing more homes of every kind, including accessory residential units or ARUs like basement apartments, laneway houses, and secondary uh, story apartments. And that's why earlier this fall, uh, the minister announced our government is moving forward with common sense new regulatory changes that would reduce or eliminate zoning barriers that currently impede the construction of these types of housing by making changes to address things like angular plans maximum lot coverages, our changes will help make it easier for homeowners and home builders to build these much needed units. Constructions of ARUs help drive down rental costs by increasing the rental supply, while also providing families with more flexibility to make it easier to build laneway houses and garden suites for elderly family members. Speaker. The member from Davenport earlier Response. said, where are the homes? Those ARUs are in the city of Stratford, Speaker, because they're getting built because of our government's changes to ensure we get more homes built so people Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the number four, Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question's for the Premier, but for folks tuning in and folks in the House, I'm just going to warn people my question's about gender-based violence. Uh, Speaker, people in Ottawa have been mourning the loss of Berkti Berhe, a 36-year-old mother who was stabbed to death in a local park in the south end of our city in broad daylight in front of her children. This heinous act was committed by a man known to Berkti. She was helping her auntie end a violent, troubled relationship with this man. And for that, she was targeted and killed. The Ottawa police have labeled this heinous act the femicide, the second our city has had in two months. But Speaker, no one should die for helping a loved one leave a violent home. Victim services experts are telling me that this tragedy sadly could have been avoided. Will the government commit to working with those experts so this never happens again? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, our, uh, our government has been very clear, Mr. Speaker. We want to make sure that all the victims and all their families and all the survivors have access to the supports that they need, Mr. Speaker, which is why we are working with our municipal partners, with the federal government, to make sure that those supports are accessible so that every single person uh, in their communities is working with, whether it's the victim services, whether it's the local service providers, which is why we announced Ontario Stands, Ontario's Action Plan to end gender-based violence in all forms in this province, Mr. Speaker. We back that up by substantial investment, $1.4 billion over three years, to make sure our community partners and members have access to those supports. Mr. Speaker, we're also working with the federal government. We signed on the National Action Plan to End Gender-Based Violence that provides an additional $162 million so that every survivor, every victim has the supports they need, Mr. Speaker, in their communities across the province because, Mr. Speaker, no woman or girl in this province should ever have to live, live with, uh, with fear of persecution or violence in our communities. Supplementary question. Uh, speaker, I thank the member for his response, but I want to return to the incident I'm raising this morning because Burke D was trying to help her auntie leave a violent relationship. But that courageous act of bystander intervention, it can't be based on individuals alone. It needs public support. Berkney needed culturally appropriate public services and languages and capacity available that would work to keep her auntie, herself, and her children safe. And we have failed that family, sadly. People need help to leave these relationships. And when that help is needed, it has to be prompt, culturally appropriate, and well-funded. There used to be a fund in this province that would help people up to an amount of $20,000 to find legal help, to move, and to get out of violent homes. That fund no longer exists. Hmm. Women's shelters and support workers for those shelters, I believe, Speaker, they deserve to be funded just as much as our hospitals, because they are critical in keeping us safe. Here, here. Yeah. To stop the femicides, Speaker, and to honour Burkdy today, will the government commit to making sure those funds get to the front line so no one, as the minister just said, ever Question. has to worry about leaving a violent home? Please take those seats. The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Order. Mr. Speaker, you know, as my colleague said, we will never, ever waver in making sure we are investing in the organizations, in programs who support women and ensure keeping women safe. Mr. Speaker, a total of $1.4 billion is invested through our government to these organizations. We've increased the funding to the Assaulted Women's Helpline, Mr. Speaker, and I'm going to say that number on camera so that every woman has this number. It's 1-866-863-0511. Now, the members opposite might scoff and laugh at these concrete Order. strategies that we're doing to help keep women safe, but we're going to continue to invest, as well as programs that are culturally sensitive and help women who are, regardless of where they come from, like the Women's Economic Security Program. I announced $26.7 million across Ontario so that women can get wraparound supports and all of the resources needed so that they can help rebuild their lives and free violence permanently, Mr. Sure. Speaker. We're going to continue to do this work because we know that women are the future and women are the heart of a community, of a family, and of Ontario. Sure, Thank sure. you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Nova Scotia, cash-strapped municipalities are allowed to charge private utilities like Enbridge a fee for the use of public land for their fossil gas infrastructure, but not in Ontario. As a result, local taxpayers are being forced to subsidize Enbridge while property taxes go up, services are cut, and municipalities don't have the financial resources they need to address the housing and homelessness crisis. But a multi-billion dollar company with a $19 million CEO gets a free ride. The member from Kitchener and I plan to introduce a bill to get rid of this hidden subsidy. 
So, Speaker, will the Premier join us in putting people's needs ahead of giant gas companies like Enbridge by saying yes to allowing municipalities to charge gas utilities fair fees for the use of public land? Question. The Associate Minister of Energy Intensive Industries. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the member opposite for his question, but I want to be very clear to the members who are in this House and all those who are watching today. Uh, the member's underlying ideology that defines this legislation he's brought forward is one uh, that was characterized by the Liberals' Green Energy Act. And what did we see as a result of the Green Energy Act? We saw a 300 percent increase in electricity rates here in the province of Ontario. We saw a massive increase because of the ideology that said, no, we need taxation instead of technology. We need to punish families. We need to punish job creators instead of incentivizing them to reduce emissions while growing our economy. We have a different approach, Speaker, and through our en Affordable Energy Act, which was tabled last week by Minister Stephen Lecce, we're seeing that we're taking an all-hands-on-deck approach to energy affordability, efficiency, and sustainability, and we're never going to back away from that promise because it's for the seniors, the job creators, and the families in our ridings who Response. rely on affordable, reliable, clean energy that we will continue to make investments to support every family in the province of Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, this is the exact rationale the government used when they took the unprecedented step of overturning an independent OEB decision for the first time in Ontario history that would have protected consumers. But then the narwhal revealed in private government emails the government members were more concerned about corporate profits for Enbridge than they were in saving people money. In Edmonton, home of the Oilers, city council there charges a fee for the use of public land for fossil gas infrastructure, collecting over $60 million for people in Edmonton to spend on the things they need. But we can't do that in Ontario. So if it's good enough for Alberta, why isn't good enough for Ontario? I think a company Question. that earned $1.3 billion in profits last quarter can afford to pay their fair share. So, Speaker, I give the government an opportunity to say yes for standing up for people and saying no to a free ride for giant Associate Minister of Energy Intensive Industries. Thank you much, Speaker. Uh, my parents have a large farmhouse. They spend between $800 and $1,200 a month in the winter months heating that farmhouse because it is on home heating oil. And the reality is they want to have natural gas. It would be far more affordable and it would reduce emissions. And that's why our government has brought forward the National Gas Natural Gas Expansion Program. In response to calls from municipalities to be able to move those heavier, more intensive uh, uh, fuels off of the market to be able to replace it with cleaner burning natural gas. But it's not just natural gas, Speaker. We're taking an all of the above approach. We're ignoring the ideology that drove up hydro rates by 300 percent under the former Liberal government, supported by the NDT, NDP. And we're saying that affordability is our bottom line as a province and as a government. We're committed to ensuring that in rural Ontario, in urban Ontario, every single person in this province has access to clean, reliable, affordable energy so that they are being supported to make investments that they don't have to worry about heating and eating. To support the legislation that the member opposite brought forward would be harmful for the economic security of our province. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. Young entrepreneurs and small businesses are the backbone of Ontario's economy, driving innovation, job creation and growth. Yet these emerging business owners often face numerous and unique challenges, from accessing capital to navigating complex regulations. In addition to these hurdles, the Trudeau-Crombie carbon tax hurts their ability to grow and to compete. The Trudeau-Crombie carbon tax burdens small businesses with increased costs for transportation, heating and operations, making it even harder for young entrepreneurs to succeed. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please outline what supports our government is providing to help young entrepreneurs and newly established small businesses thrive? Good question. Associate Minister for Small Business. Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Burlington for the question and the work that she is doing to support young entrepreneurs in her riding. 
Speaker, launching a business can be the start of an exciting journey. By many young entrepreneurs, they have so much trouble accessing the financing and the mentorship that they need to succeed. That's why it was great to join the member from Burlington alongside the member from Oakville North Burlington to announce our government's investment of $2 million to Futurepreneur Canada, a non-profit organization dedicated to fostering entrepreneurship. Through this partnership, young innovators receive crucial support from financing options to mentorship programs designed to make their vision a reality. In addition, we're committed to reducing barriers like high costs and regulatory hurdles, making it easier for small businesses to thrive in Ontario. Response. Unlike the opposing provincial Liberals who continue to support the devastating carbon tax that drives up costs, we're focused on practical solutions that empower the next generation of business leaders. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for that response. It's encouraging to hear how our government is making meaningful investments that secure Ontario's place as the best place to do business anywhere in the world. Speaker, young entrepreneurs and new small business owners have an important role to play in Ontario's economy. These individuals often bring fresh ideas and new technologies that can transform industries and help build the communities they're in. That's why our government must ensure young entrepreneurs and new small business owners have access to the tools they need to thrive in today's economy. Speaker, can the Associate Minister tell the House why it is critical that we continue supporting emerging business leaders and how their contributions shape a prosperous future for Ontario? The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you again to the member for the question. Speaker, the President of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, the CFIB, stated that the federal Liberals have ignored the troubling trend of business closures. For several months now, more businesses have been exiting than entering the Canadian economy, which underscores the need to support young entrepreneurs who are essential to our economic success. That is why in Ontario, our government is focused on providing young entrepreneurs and new small business owners with the resources and supports they need by investing in organizations like Futurepreneur Canada to ensure their long-term success. By fostering an environment where new businesses can thrive, we're investing in a prosperous future for Ontario, one led by the passion and ingenuity of these emerging leaders. Here. We will always have Response. the backs of Ontario's young entrepreneurs because we know when they thrive, Ontario thrives. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Unifor is launching a campaign to stop the leaks in our natural gas system here in Ontario. Unifor leaders are here with us today to push this cause. Enbridge, Enbridge is not acting to prevent or stop those leaks. Leaking gas means higher gas bills. We all know what that means. It means risks to people's lives, including the lives of Enbridge workers. It means a hotter world, and it can mean in worst-case situations, explosions. Will the Premier bring in regulations to require Enbridge to actually stop the leaks and prevent new ones? The Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question from the member opposite. Speaker, when it comes uh, to protecting workers, uh, this Premier is, is open for any suggestions. We've shown multiple times through multiple pieces of legislation that we, we won't stop by taking action when it comes from recommendations from Prevention Council, when it comes to working with our union partners, or when it comes from suggestions from the members opposite. We've seen it in the last Working for Workers bill, where we worked together uh, to protect workers, and we'll always keep an open door when it comes to taking measures, and I'm happy to work with Enbridge to do just that. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you very much. And back to the Premier. Unifor members are skilled workers, and they know how to fix leaks and how to prevent them from happening. And yet, Enbridge continues to contract out repair work and continues to ignore leaks for weeks. This is obviously a public safety issue. Enbridge is using unskilled workers cutting the overnight and evening emergency services. This Conservative government likes to talk about how they support skilled, unionized workers. Will this government 
support these un skilled unionized gas workers who are here today up in the balcony and require Enbridge to use its own workers to fix and prevent leaks before there is a real emergency in Ontario involving gas before somebody dies. Thank you. Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you to the questions from the member opposite. Look forward to working uh, with Unifor uh, to address uh, these issues, and I'm happy to meet with the members of Unifor who are here today. I appreciate the question from the member opposite. I, I do like that he's focused on skills. It's regrettable that he's voted against our skills development fund on multiple times, something we've used to elevate competencies in both the compulsory and voluntary trade, Speaker, and he's voted against the climate that's attracted uh, millions of jobs for Unifor workers in places like Windsor and Brampton and others that are retooling investments this government's making to support uh, these unionized workers. They know that when we attract these uh, world-class investments, their members are at work working hard. It's a shame that party opposite voted against that and continue to stand against those investments Response. that are in the best interests of those unionized workers. The next question, the member for... Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Rural Affairs. The trudeau Crombie carbon tax is disproportionately impacting families and businesses in rural Ontario. People in rural and remote communities have to travel longer distances and rely on their vehicles more heavily for work. They should not be punished with higher costs for fuel. But, Speaker, since the implementation of this tax, businesses in rural Ontario are struggling to absorb the increased expenses. The added financial strain only makes it harder for these businesses to compete, innovate and thrive. The federal government needs to respect rural communities and abolish the tax today. Speaker, can the minister tell the House why families and business sectors of rural Ontario cannot afford a carbon tax? Here, here. Here, here. The, the response, the Minister of Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to share with everyone that the member from Whippy has got it absolutely right. The carbon tax is oh, dis disproportionately affecting families and businesses in rural Ontario. You know what was interesting? Just this past weekend, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, attended one of the best opening weekends of the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. Was it ever busy? But I can tell you honestly, when country came to the city and the Prime Minister was right in the thick of it all, he was less than warmly welcomed. And I would dare say the Queen of the Carbon Tax would be even less because oh. she doesn't know what it's like to live in rural Ontario because businesses, like, are, yeah. small businesses, are paying almost 40% of the total sum of carbon tax. And what are they getting in return? A pittance. It's making their cost of business Response. go through the roof and they don't have any other choice than to pass it over to the consumers in small town rural Ontario. This is an absolute here, here. disaster that both the Prime Minister <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's great to see that unlike the carbon tax queen Bonnie Crombie and her Liberal colleagues, our government is making good on our promises to keep costs low and fight this job-killing tax. Speaker, we know that rural Ontario is bearing the burden of rising costs driven by the trudeau Crombie carbon tax. That's why we must continue to advocate on their behalf and ensure that their voices are being heard. Unlike the Liberals, our government cannot leave rural Ontario behind. Speaker, can the Minister share how our government is supporting rural Ontario in the face of this tax grab? Yeah. Minister of Rural Affairs. Thank you very much. I think it's important to recognize that we have a, a Liberal Party and an NDP party that are very urban-centric, and they don't even begin to understand what it takes to do business and to raise families in small communities in rural Ontario. And that 
is absolutely a travesty. But thank goodness, through the leadership of Premier Ford and our entire government, we actually are listening, we understand, and quite frankly, we live it every day. And that's why we're bringing forward programs that are making a difference. We've extended the reduction in the gas tax by 5.7 cents through to the end of next June in 2025. And we also are making sure that people have money left in their pockets with the two per person and child that families and households will be receiving early next year. Speaker, we're the government that gets it. We have a plan to build Ontario where the carbon tax, Crombie and Trudeau desire to use it as a cash grab. We are going to stand up on behalf of Ontarians and say, scrap the tax. That concludes our question period for this morning.